Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you guys today. Um, I want to invite you into two events that were happening in my life at approximately the same time. Just a few years ago, these two events could not have been any more different, yet they were happening at the same time, and I stood at the center of each of them. In 2007, I had this opportunity to travel to Darfur, Sudan with the elders. At the same time, back home, my family was planning my son Connor's second birthday party. While I was standing face to face with some of the world's greatest injustice, my family was home in San Antonio planning Connor's party. My Blackberry became the epicenter of these two worlds colliding. I sit on a wonderful board, a group of um, individuals called the Elders. They were founded by Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, President Carter and others are members of this board. They've gotten together and they're a council that fights to bring peace where there is none in the world. I sit along with nine others on their advisory board council and I get to travel regularly with them and spend time with them talking about the world's disasters and ways that we might be able to find a way to bring peace. In 2007, I was on one of these such trips with them in Darfur. We were walking through the camps, looking at the terrible situations there in Darfur. I was walking alongside President Carter and Archbishop Tutu. We were listening to the people tell us about their long raging genocide, tell us stories, horrific stories of rape, murder, devastation. And in the evening, I was sending off Blackberry messages to my husband about the kind of cake that we should order for Connor's birthday party and what the theme should be. While in these refugee camps, we learned so much about this long-raging war, and we listened to these people talk about how they had to fight daily just to survive. No sooner did I get back from Darfur that I was headed back home to Texas to celebrate Connor's birthday with an under-the-sea birthday party. Seventy people came that, that Saturday to celebrate my son. Seventy people came to celebrate his life just because he was turning two. So many gifts. I thought to myself, there has to be a way to turn this around. There has to be a way to galvanize all that enthusiasm and energy and flip it on its head and have people rallying around the situations overseas and the tragedies overseas just as much as they rally around birthday parties here and do it just as consistently. I'm going to ask you today to give me your full attention, and then I'm going to ask you to do something harder, to give your full attention to one of the great tragedies on our globe, human trafficking. One particular area of focus in my, in my human rights work has been human trafficking, but more specifically, sex trafficking. Defined by the Federal Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. A commercial sex act is any sex act upon which anything of value, financial or kind, or in kind, is given or received by any person. While most of my work and my exposure to human trafficking is overseas, it's a very real problem in our backyards. An estimated one out of every five men, women, and children who have been victims of sex trafficking in the United States have passed through Texas. Put it another way, 20% of all human trafficking victims nationwide have been located in Texas at one point or another. San Antonio has been seen as a hub for human trafficking due to its proximity to the I-10 corridor, which has been identified as the, by the United States Department of Justice as a trafficking route. It's an industry that has generated $27 billion globally, $9.5 billion last year in the United States alone. In 2008, 600 to 800,000 people were trafficked in the U.S., and worldwide, 2.4 million people have been trafficked, half of which are minors. Human trafficking became personal for me in 2003. I graduated from law school in 2000, and I began practicing law in a large downtown Dallas law firm. I was practicing insurance law. After a very short 11 months, I knew that I wanted to use my law degree to try and make a difference in the lives of those who suffered from terrible injustices but had no access to law professionals. 
I wanted to lend a voice to those who were suffering in silence. So I packed up all my things, and I left the only state in which I've ever lived to head to Washington, D.C. to work for a human rights organization. This organization had just started sending lawyers and other law professionals overseas to fight injustices like child prostitution, child slavery, illegal detention, and torture. That was the beginning of an almost nine-year journey that I'm still on today. A journey that at times takes me to places of unimaginable horrors. But I can also thankfully say that it gives me an opportunity to witness the beauty of rescue and redemption. In the spring of 2003, that journey took me to a place called Spe Pa. It's a small village in Cambodia. You see, a few months prior, some of our investigators had gone to check out reports of young girls being used for sex. They went undercover in several brothels and confirmed, unfortunately, that the reports were true. They came back to D.C. and showed us their undercover footage, and it was of extremely young girls, some as young as five, who were being traded and sold for sex. Ignoring this horror was not an option. Something had to be done, and that something ended up being Operation Eleven. The name came from a little girl who was in the footage who, when asked by our investigators how old she was, she looked up and with a childlike voice said, Eleven. While things did not go exactly as planned and we did not get an opportunity to rescue them all, we were able to rescue 37. We interviewed them and in the safe houses we heard atrocious stories. Girls brutally beaten, cigarettes extinguished in their beautiful skin by their rapists. Some of the girls had a harder time walking because of so much scar tissue between their legs. Yet I was surprised in all this to find a child still. You see, I had worried that our work was going more towards saving the next generation, that these girls' lives were ruined. But I was wrong. They were children still. They laughed and danced with me. They crawled into my lap. They cried at night when it was time to go to bed. Yes, there was damage, but their faces only showed hopefulness. In the midst of such urgent situations, I think we all find ourselves hoping that we would do the right thing that we could be brave and strong. I believe that every day that we spend on this earth, we're offered unique opportunities to save lives. You see, the simple notion that our world is a needy one gives us that opportunity every day. The crime of human trafficking can easily leave you all bolted to your chairs in despair. But I know that if we choose to focus on this problem, we can put an end to this tragedy once and for all. Because when America chooses to show up, we can and do make a difference. Less than two years ago, you guys remember, the swine flu was flooding the press. April 1st, 2009, swine flu was discovered. Three weeks later, production of a new vaccine had begun. Two months later, the pandemic was declared. And less than four months after swine flu had been identified, we set out to vaccinate 159 million people at risk. In May 2000, 2010, just over a year later, the flu season was declared complete and the pandemic was over. When we choose to give our full attention to a problem, we can make a difference. This is only part of my story. And I showed up today believing that one of you out there has a better solution to this problem. Frankly, I'm counting on it. There are so many reasons to hope. There are local responders right here in San Antonio. To give one example, the Embassy of Hope. The Embassy of Hope works to present, prevent youth from becoming a statistic of human trafficking. And it provides for the complex needs of those who were once victims to this evil. There are many victims of human trafficking simply because they don't have a hero. There are local shelters here that don't have enough resources or volunteers. And one of you can be a hero in the life of an abused child simply by showing up and offering some part of what you have. I began speaking to you today by offering a contrast between my son's second birthday party and the situation in Darfur. In closing, I'd like to invite you for a second time into a very personal space. I travel internationally a lot and my children are young. 
too young to know, in fact, why I go to these places and what I'm doing there. But I want them to know someday where mommy was going and why she was going there. So I will often sit down on my travels and journal for them. Connor just turned five years old and my little Brody is about to be two. I would like to read to you a portion of a journal entry that I wrote to them. Connor and Brody, my prayer is that you will make the world a better place and seek peace and justice throughout your life. I hope that things I have done, mistakes that I have learned from, can be of some help to you in your own journeys. There is something incredibly dangerous about knowledge. In this case, it is the same as notice. I've been there. I've seen the faces of those moms and those children. I have listened with my own ears, and I've heard their cries for peace and security. I have held their hands and cried with them. I am on notice. It is happening, every bit of it. As far away and as foreign as we want it to be, it is not. As incredible technology affords you, Connor, a little touchscreen gadget that fits into your pocket and plays any number of videos or movies on your command in about half a second. There they wait, waiting, waiting in the most prehistoric of conditions, which fight their everyday efforts to stay alive and keep their families safe and alive. In this case, my dear ones, knowledge equals notice. Like my boys, when you all are old enough to understand, I mean, when they are under old enough to understand this letter, <laughs> you guys are all old enough, you're not off the hook, um, I'm asking you to commit from this day forward to just be aware of what's going on around you. It's going on in your backyards, it's going on a plane right away. I'm asking you not to ignore this tragic evil that is human trafficking, because I believe that there is a responsibility that each of us has in the matter of justice to bring forward what we have, our skills, our attentions, our resources, and our time to bear on this great problem. This is the grand opportunity that's being placed before you and before each of us to serve those who suffer. I think sometimes in the busyness of living that we lose sight of the business of life. I hope that each one of you will embrace this moment in your lives to use your talent and your time, giving freely of yourself to those less fortunate than you. Where others spend their lives building careers, I hope that you will spend your careers building lives. And I hope that you will always remember that there's nothing more powerful in the whole world than getting involved in something bigger than yourself. Thank you.